Right, well, here we are, guys. I'm back at Bluebell. Anyway, uh, ended up on Swan, which is one of my favourites, probably the second favourite. I like kingfisher the best, but Swan's got some mega fish in it, so I want to come on here. And uh, started fishing on the bottom, uh, about 70 yards out. There's weed going 65, 70 yards, so just cast a lead down around to start with to see where the weed ended and just to get some kind of a drop and uh, the drop I got was very good once you got past the initial bank of weed so I did a couple of casts where I got a soft drop on the weed got a good drop so I worked out the distance clipped up fish three rods like that and then uh, just on bags initially anyway the weather suddenly changed and went really quite hot and warm which is unusual because it's been crap recently the weather we've had a lot of rain and it's been overcast and uh, anyway i've seen fish come close in in the weed and i've seen them vorticing and swirling uh, some were sucking at leaves on the top and part of me wanted to put zigs on all three but i've not i've resisted for the time being i've just put one out as a tester and I've already had a bit of an occurrence on it. And uh, I put it in a gap between two big weed beds. I'm guessing it's about five or six foot deep. So I'll set it half depth because it's weed. that I used a little tiny one ounce in line. So that'll rest on the weed. And uh, I'm fishing it about three feet from the lead. So I've caught where the fish are moving. And uh, hopefully I've set it the right depth for where I'm seeing them. And that occurrence tells me that you know prob probably a reasonable depth where they're going to intercept it so uh, i'm going to give that a little tester and then if i see more and more fish coming in i'll probably switch to two maybe three rods on the zigs so uh, yeah uh, it's never easy this place it's, it's one of them places that you know if you sit on the right time and they're having it you know you hear about the success stories but you don't see the time and the effort that people put in to to get to that point you know and it's one of them waters where you get tuned into it as well i've just seen an old mate of mine and uh you know ryan and he he knows it really well he's he knows all the intricacies of this place because he's fished it for quite a few years and on a regular basis you know i do random trips over here perhaps once every three months i used to come a lot more but i uh i can't handle the crowds like i used to do as I get older, I like a bit of tranquility and that, you know, so uh, it's a, it's a bit, bit of a love-hate relationship with this place. I, I adore it. I like seeing Tony and Lynn who own it and Jim and my friends that I know from here. But also, I, I'm a little bit like, well, I, I, I crave the quiet waters now. So, uh, but I still love it here. It's got amazing fishing, so I'm still drawn back, you know, so... Uh, Anyway, we'll see. Ah, oh, this fish, this fish right near me, Zig. Now, a couple of fish breezing past it. So uh, let's let's hope it happens. Yeah, I'll show you if it does. thought you guys might want to see typically the kind of rig that I use. This is one I was using this morning. Uh, nothing revolutionary. I use, I really do favour these PB products uh, leaders, the, the uh, coated ones. It's like a tungsten type stuff and uh, they're very supple. And where allowed, I find them really good. Uh, good anti-tangle properties. They break at about £35. And uh, loop to loop, you know, tight straight to the shot leader in seconds. That's good. 
Uh, funny thing about lead clips I'm using, I do favour lead clips over helicopter type of setups generally. I'd rather lengthen the up length off than, uh, you know, use the helicopter where it's moving. I think there's, there's sometimes if you've got a semi-slight line, there's, there's quite a lot of movement before they actually make contact with the lead with helicopters. But with this, you know, it's fairly direct. I tend to use heavy leads, as we've discussed before. Uh, I always use an anti-tangle sleeve. I'm not mad about using all these rings and uh, stiff booms and stuff. I have used them. Uh, it's not really made a huge difference to my fishing, so I tend to just stick to things that are functional that I'm used to uh, and that work. Uh, on here, you, we've got to use barbless hooks. So I'm using a size, I think it's a five trig hammer, the uh, uh, ESP ones. Uh, it's like a semi long shank and I'm using a slip D, using a little corner micro ring swivel and uh, coated up length which is £25. And uh, as I've said many times before, this isn't a blatant plug. I've been catching tons of fish on this for years. The uh, Enterprise plastic corn on top of a a pop-up or a wafter. In this case, it's a, it's a wafter, so it sits almost like on the point like that. The shot's there merely just to add a little bit of extra weight to drag it down into the floor of the fish's mouth when it sucks it in. I have used them a lot bigger than this, but uh, on this occasion, I ran out of the bigger shots, would you believe? And uh, a little confession here, when I, when I go to France when I'm on my travels I always go in the fishing tackle shops and get the uh, the big shot dispensers over there I know they're banned for general use over here but for, for just putting on a rig like this I don't see any problem with it and some of the other stuff that you get is pretty huge and virtually weighs nothing so uh, yeah that's that's the that's the components on that one the same rig can easily incorporate a, a pop-up or a, a wafter this is a little 12 milli that I had out uh, first thing. Uh, the hook might look a bit large compared with the boilie size, but really don't worry about that. Carp size are on the side of the head. Uh, this is almost, you know, exclusively close to the bottom with a single, so the fish will clock it and then upend and go down on it. They very rarely approach it, you know, as though they're going straight on on the bottom they have to open to, to get it so their eyes are on the side of the head they can't quite see what's going on it's all by the suck so they suck it in and then whether your rig's refined enough is whether it stays in and the particular you know the dynamic of the way that they've sucked it in and when they make contact with your lead or you know the rig's doing its job and they, they're struggling to eject it that's when you get your bite but don't worry about the size of bait compared to the hook. I mean, I, I remember one occasion years ago, I was fishing uh, Birch Grove in the winter and I was using size eight long shanks. I was catching quite a lot of fish actually uh, on the winter syndicate. And I'd caught a couple of mid thirties uh, that were well-known fish. And uh, to my horror, I ran out of the size eights and I only had sixes. And I thought, oh, this is gonna ruin everything. So I put the sixes on and the catch rate went up. And they were quite a big six as well. I was using really small baits. And then I started messing around using uh, fours with the same size bait again. Didn't slow down the action. It, it actually improved it again. So, you know, don't be scared of using a, a big hook. But uh, there are certain circumstances where it might be a bit, bit better to be refined, you know, like in a solid bag. They're using really small light items but uh, generally speaking, no big deal. You know, carp have got big mouths in proportion to the size of the hook, so they can easily blow a small item out. You know, it's, it's like uh, putting something in there that's gonna block that hole and not reverse out so easy, so yeah.
don't buy your top tips for fishing pressured waters. Top tips for fishing pressured waters, blimey. Um, obviously, on places like this, I'm on Swan at the moment, uh, I think there's 20 odd anglers on here, and there's been two fish caught to all concerned in the last two days. So, it's not obviously not a pushover. Uh, you can't have the luxury of chasing the fish and finding the fish usually. It's just getting a swim that's the, uh, the main goal. So location's out of the window quite a lot. And if you, unless you're lucky and land on a group of fish in a swim that comes available, you've kind of got to be super circumspect about what you're doing. Uh, I mean, no matter how long I've been doing it, I still fall on my face. It happens to everybody. You can have a game plan and all the rest of it, and it can just not work. Sometimes it'll work and it looks great, you know, but uh, generally people turn up and use what they have had success with on other waters, near where they live, perhaps. And then uh, I say it all the time with first timers that come down here, you know, that they have their established baits that they use at home and that they catch well on. And one thing that sprung to mind on here that's worth bearing in mind is and on other pressured waters. There's always going to be going baits that are used more often on them venues. And I was on Kingfisher uh, last year. I was talking to a guy that had just started fishing there and uh, he didn't know the complex. And basically he'd spent three or four days using his own bait, doing his own thing and it hadn't worked. So he's, he wasn't a stupid man, this guy. He'd worked out that uh, the couple of people that were catching were using established baits that are sold on the complex. So a lot of that bait's going in those venues. And no matter how you dress it up, you know, that has got some gravitas to it because you imagine it, it's like, the fish are weaned onto it, it's going in regular by all and sundry that have switched onto it. There might be a bait team on it. And those fish are probably at thousands of those baits. But you turn up with your new bait from a different water that you know you might use on your local venue, and it's an alien thing. The fish ain't stupid, they're thinking, hang on, this is new, it's a trap, I've not seen this before. You know, I don't know whether it's good or bad. Whereas the established bait, they know what they're getting. They're probably weaned onto it, they like it. And they probably, for every capture, they probably eat quite a lot of that bait. So it's the safer option. So I would say, based on, you know, my findings, uh, this guy, by the way, that I was talking about, he blanked for four days. He went to the shop, bought a bag of this bait and some pop-ups and that, and wafters. And he had a 40 and I think two or three thirties. And he told me about it. And uh, so I'm not trying to sell any, any little bait company's bait or anything. I'm just saying it, it is an option to find out which baits are popular on there and take it as an option with you, rather than put all your eggs in one basket with the bait that you're used to as a plan B or to use on one rod as a tester a bait that's established on the water is the way forward, I think. Uh, the other thing that's obvious is on a pressured venue, the fish are easily spooked by noise. I know it's easy to say, ah, oh, they're used to it. It doesn't matter if you get your hammer out and bang your, your pegs in with a mallet or whatever. Uh, it's just a no-no. You don't want to be doing that. I mean, no matter what people say, less noise is better. and. I also know for a fact that uh, it's often worth sitting and watching for a good few hours before committing the rods to spots, just on an intuition or a guess, unless you're seeing fish. I would say it's better to sit and observe for a few hours in your swim, and your swim's resting as well, especially where on this place, for example, people are queuing up to get in your swim. People are going around asking when you're going. So there's never any lines out of the water in the swim. So if you can rest your swim for a little bit, uh, maybe there's a, there's a mate of mine doing a strategy over there. He's uh, fishing in the margins whilst pre-baiting at distance. 
with no lines in on the food at distance. That's a great way of doing it. And, uh, you know, a very good thought process gone into that. And I think if you've got enough time at your disposal, say you've got three or four days rather than a shorter session. On a shorter session, of course, you, you want the rods in. I know that, I do it myself. But if you've got a couple of three days, four days, you don't mind sacrificing a day with the rods out to get the fish in on your, on your food, especially when you're actually waiting for fish, baiting and waiting on a lot of these sort of places. So it's worth sacrificing that time to do that. So I think that's another strategy. And uh, I think sometimes you don't know what's gone in before you. So you turn up, you've got a, a, a plan. It might work on your home waters where you put in a couple of kilo of bait. You don't know how many people have been in in short order before you, unless you've spoke to them, but generally it's a hell of a turnover. And on waters that are pressured, there's so much bait going in all the time, you don't know what you're fishing over. So it's best to always start really, really slowly, you know, just with bags maybe, and then build up as you go. And uh, the other thing, of course, is to, to commit the same thing on every rod, unless you actually know that's a, that's a winning formula. I think it's as well to use a different approach on every rod till you round on what's going to work. And then, of course, if you find the winning formula, you can switch the other rods to it. But, the, you know, the, it's no point in waiting to see somebody else's caught doing something completely different to what you've got on all three of your rods. At least if you've got a different thing on each, you might be edging towards the winning formula. So that's another thing to think about. And, uh, you know, this here's another uh, aspect, I think. I'll give you an analogy. I, I tend to use fluorocarbon leaders where leaders are allowed, shock leaders. I use this uh, PB brand. It's not, a, it's not a blatant advert. It's expensive, this stuff. And uh, I used it years ago, and I've... I've enjoyed using it, caught a lot of fish doing it. And it's called Dragonfly, and it's a 26 pound fluorocarbon, and it really is incredible stuff. Very strong, very inconspicuous. And we were making a, a film a couple of weeks ago in France, and uh, there's four of us on there, and I was fishing to snags, and I'd been on horseshoe where shot leaders aren't allowed. And I turned up on the French venue, and in my haste to get in, I'd, I'd missed out an obvious thing that I should have done. I should have addressed it. I used the 20 pound nylon straight through without putting my shot leaders on. I was only fishing at about 50 yards, but I was fishing tight to snags. Uh, so you can't have slack lines in that situation. So the lines were cutting through the water like laser beams over to the snags. Lost the fish straight away and then no more bites for a couple of days. And I was scratching my head and the fish just wouldn't come through to swim. They were avoiding me and going right in the back of the snags. I've not put the, uh, the fluorocarbon back on. So I had all three rods in, put the fluorocarbon leaders back on. I, I didn't think it would be that much of a difference. Put the rods out and then start catching fish. <laughs> like clockwork, rods going off all the time. And it wasn't coincidence because on the syndicate where I fish, I use the same leaders and I'm fishing across 30 feet of water in some swims over to pads. And I've caught untold fish on there. But when I've tried it without those fluorocarbon leaders on, I've had far less. Because a lot of lines are green or brown or, you know, they glint in the sun and them fish are surely aware of it. So the fluorocarbon leaders that camouflage the last bit of your, you know, the the important bit is definitely the way forward. So I would advise that if you can use leaders on your water. And I think it's a big, big plus. I mean, I don't like using fluorocarbon all the way onto the reel because it casts like a bag of spanners, let's face it, it's terrible. And I'm not bothered about the, the line being on the bottom right in front of my rods, unless I'm margin fishing. So anything over sort of 30 yards, I like the leaders on to keep the, the business end down on the bottom and in, as inconspicuous as possible. And it works, so that's worth considering.
So uh, there are a few off, off my head, you know, that I think are worth considering. Moon phases, well, it certainly, it certainly works if you go deep into it. Uh, I know from doing a lot of sea fishing that when you get the big spring tides and the, the autumn equi equinox that you get the big tides and sea fishing's better. So it follows that coarse fish are not too dissimilar to sea fish. They've evolved from the sea. So of course, moon phases do affect the feeding patterns of fish. Uh, I did go right into it and used to book my holidays off work and everything according to the moon phases. And, uh, but some, some of the time, you know, you get it wrong. Maybe you were in the wrong swim and it would be easy to think, oh, the moon phase doesn't make any difference. But I think it does. Uh, there's, there's, there's the old, thing about big fish feeding on a full moon and I do think that's true I think I found that to be the case myself particularly commons for some reason I've had some really big commons that's coincided with exactly a full moon not Jesus <laughs> but dirty great big trees just collapsed and got in the lake that must be to do with the moon anyway the, the gravity of the full moon last night has probably pulled the tree down yeah, where were we? Uh, yeah, basically what they do is they... It, I would go as far as to say that moon affects humans, your behaviour. Uh, they've done surveys all over the world. Supermarkets stock up and reduce stock depending on the moon phases. I know it sounds crazy, but humans eat more on a certain moon phase. Hamsters, all animals have certain periods within a month where they eat more and then reduce down. And they did a survey, by the way, and they checked that maybe it was just because people, just before they got paid at the end of the month, they were a bit skint, so they weren't buying as much food. But that wasn't the case. It was to do with the moon phases when they analysed it. So it follows that it, it should happen with fish. And it does, but the weird thing is, on a full moon, you'd expect them to feed heavier because it affects the tides more. The bit that I could never justify in my mind was the fact that the, the pull of the moon should have coincided with the bigger tides, which it does. Sea fishing, it tends to be very good when that happens, but, but carp fishing, not precise. Sometimes it was the waxing moon or the waning moon. And I, I find it very hard to justify booking your holidays around it because a lot of the time you've got to take when you can get you know you might have other people at work that have got other weeks and you've just got to take it so i stopped looking at the moon phases a little bit because it was a bit depressing if you couldn't get the the moon phase that you fancied anyway i uh you know there's there's quite a complex situation and, and subject and i think that uh I mean, old Tim Paisley, he swore by it. You know, he used to he used to like the waxing moon, uh, which was just before the full moon. And uh, I think that was what he preferred. So he'd time all his sessions on the mangrove and everything to coincide with that. And, uh, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a curious anomaly, really. I said to Chris Ball when he used to, run carp talk with uh, Kev Clifford. I says, listen, why don't you, instead of just putting down what carp were caught on, i.e. the bait or the rig, or as an additional, really request to everybody that they put the date that they caught the fish on. So then at the beginning of carp talk, you could have a moon phase chart, and then you could actually look if there was a correlation between the captures of a lot of big fish with the moon phase so that you get some valid information out of it. And he says, oh, brilliant idea. He never did it till years later where that became a talking point, which was a shame really because I remember uh, Paddy Webb who worked for Carp Talk and Crowey, they used to say to me 
it's amazing there'll be certain weeks when all over the whole of the UK it exploded and there'd be captures of big fish then there'd be other weeks where it was quiet everywhere and it wasn't to do with the weather you know where you might get a high pressure or a big low coming and they'd suddenly feed on a low it was random but it was certainly to do with moon phases and that's that was the best way that we could have logged it with all the captures in carp talk but that was all wasted unfortunately but i'm sure there is there is something to it but i haven't got the definitive answer of when you should go or not because i've caught them in every kind of moon phase you know so but i have caught some big fish on a full moon and they most have been commons that i do know so that might be something to to think about if you particularly want to target a big common you know so yeah that's it Right, reality check now. Uh, unfortunately, me and my lad uh, Guy have blanked. It's not the first blank I've ever had, it's not gonna be the last. But uh, as I said many times, I said, you've got to be in it to win it. This, this place is really busy, you know, typical day ticket, one of the best day ticket waters in Britain actually. If not the best, I think it probably is the best. And uh, the fish quality is second to none. You're fishing for very big day ticket fish. With that comes the popularity of carp fishing. Every swim on the lake's taken. There's people who can't get swims. Uh, walking on with buckets, you know, waiting for you to go. Sometimes you have to wait a long time for a swim, but it's how it is. It's the reality of it. Uh, so you're not finding the fish. You basically just got to take where you, you, you're able to get. And uh, since we've been here, there's been three fish caught, I think, to. 30 odd anglers with some coming and going maybe more so i don't feel too bad uh tried my best my son did as well guy uh we did all the things that seemed appropriate it's a fine dividing line between stuff working and not had the fish on on me for a little bit when they came in the weed where i tried the zigs over the weed uh, but the time window was quite small for that and the feeding times have been in the dark and early hours of the morning and the fish weren't in the weed at that particular time they were backing off anyway uh, just after bank holiday god knows what bait's gone in there it could have been tons of bait it probably was so uh, yeah try the gamut of different things and uh, you know as i say there's a fine dividing line between success and failure uh, i'd be lying to say that you know uh, I have success most times, it's like anybody, you know, it's like, uh, it's real. Sometimes I catch, sometimes I don't. Well, each time you don't catch something, it just builds towards the time when it's going to happen and it, it happens for you to get a cracker, you know. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm a little bit spoiled. I've got a syndicate that I'm in and the fishing's extraordinarily good. Uh, but we can't really film on there. This is about day ticket fishing, so you know it's like chalk and cheese to me that's like a fairly quiet beautiful paradise and then this is beautiful but there's a lot of people here so you know you take the rough and the smooth but i like both aspects it's good it's good to see how you go go on a, in these environments where it's busy as hell and uh, the prizes are there if you get it right i mean you can get it right and still not catch obviously you know but uh, no excuses it's happened and uh, you know, at least I'm honest and I don't edit these things out. I've got a feeling that some people would edit it all out and just keep going until they have a, you know, a real big hit or something. But as long as I've been doing it, you know, blanks are part and parcel of the furniture. So uh, this is how it is. And I'll just look forward to next time. So uh, thanks for watching. And I hope that the tips that have uh, included in this film are of some use to you guys and uh you know i'm sure some people appreciate it so uh till next time see you soon